Yeah, I was going to show, I, when I watched Keith's session, there's a couple things that Keith did that I wanted to just kind of reference. Things like I referenced with uh, when Jen was doing a couple things in her session, I referenced a couple things that she did. So <coughs> there's, a, there's something that Keith d did in that session that I, I, I can't emphasize enough, but this is, as a coach, I think you need to get comfortable walking around practice like this with three balls in your arms. And you saw how he put the ball in the play and always putting the ball in the play. Is, uh, that happens in my practices too. Like it was fun for me to watch that. And uh, one of the things that I, I often think about is about, I use the expression of the inmates. My players are like the inmates. And the inmates don't get to determine the pace of the practice, right? And if you let the inmates decide the pace of the practice, then we're gonna, our volume and our intensity is gonna drastically drop. So I think that's what Keith was controlling there. And you could see the way that he was, when he was putting the balls into play, at the first few balls he put into play, it was uncomfortable for some of those young girls that were there, but eventually they, they will totally adapt to that. And that's my thing is that, you know, what he, what he does, I do. And it's funny because we'll, I, I've had different assistant coaches that will come and work with me, and I think I'm the best coaching shagger you will find. Like I move around, I get more exercise in my practice, just kind of shagging and coaching, picking up balls and watching what's going on, but always pretty much have, you know, like two, three balls. And my assistant coaches have to figure that out. You know, like there's times when the new coach comes in and they're walking around with no ball and I'm going, you need to, you need to get like this so that we can get balls into play. And I think that keeps up the pace, the intensity of your practices, the amount of volume, the intensity you can go. Like I would say, it's like Keith and I know, <laughs> we know each other. And uh, we would find, we would think about was how do I maximize my volume and intensity? And that's one way. And I think Keith was, he was showing it there as a really good example of, you know, how to get balls into play fast to your athletes. Eventually they'll figure it out at first. It's really uncomfortable and sometimes they'll fight it. But you control that. And they, they think that they can't work that fast and I think they're wrong. You know, I know how fast they can work and I know how, f how far I can usually push it. That I point of chaos I kind of referred to before is you know when you've gone too far. But you know when you've gone too far, you can back off and you can kind of edge them to kind of keep going and stuff. So that was a really good thing I thought about running the practice. Um, Keith made a reference in his session. You heard him talk about a back catcher, you know, and using it to play defense and getting behind the ball and trying to get shoulders and stuff. And if you watch back catchers and they go, I watched a lot of baseball and I would watch baseball on TV and I see that happen. Oh, that's perfect. You know, and I started using that analogy as well. But I started to use that analogy with my U14, 15 girls. And said, you are like a back catcher. You got to get in front of it, slide in front of the ball, block it off. You see them do that. And then I go, how many of you guys watch any baseball? And not a hand goes up. How many of you played any baseball? Not a hand goes up. You go, so you go, I think about, oh, now I, I don't use that reference. If I have an audience that understands it, for sure. That's that point about transfer. You know, you try to use concepts or situations where they maybe understand it. So now you got to find something else. But I always thought it was kind of funny. I would, thinking that they're right on the same page as me, I'm excited about this, and they have no idea how a back catcher blocks off a ball and stuff. So it was a good pot. Um, the other thing I would like to just emphasize within it was the coaching cues you know and uh, asking the players sometimes you know part way through a drill because you know you know we we want that to happen we want them by the end to understand what we're working on but it, it was a perfect example when Keith asked the girls they struggled to answer it in the first couple of seconds they were thinking for a second so they're not used to that and I think uh, I do that lots is that you know, what are we working on? What are we working on? What's the key reference point that we're going to is kind of, I think, constantly sort of remind them to them. 
And the other thing that he, he did, and I was sitting beside two young girls that were coaches there, and uh, <laughs> your intensity while you were coaching beside the kids, the girl was like, oh, God, that would make me feel so uncomfortable. That's so stressful. I said, well, and I didn't say anything to him, but I thought, that's exactly it. We don't need to stop a lot of the drills to communicate. And it's another one of those things that I think they'll get used to. They'll get used to processing that stuff as, you're, as, you're, as they're working and you're talking. They'll, they'll figure that out about, about you and you'll get more out of the drills rather than stopping. And I, I know that for a fact because when I have a new coach that comes in and works with me, the minute I start talking to my players, they stop putting balls into play. And I'm going, no, 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 just keep it going and I'll... I'll kind of work within it to try to keep that volume and intensity up. But it's again, it's the inmates. If you let them, they will run the pace of it until you sort of teach them and, and go. And then I think they're totally engaged and stuff. And I think I saw that and I have a feeling that this is what happens was th those types of coaching interactions that happen in the practice keeps the volume intensity up because when I took, I have a lot of the girls that played on my team that played in a, on a 4A team with a different coach. And the first couple of practices that I run with my kids, I'm thinking, what is going on? These kids have just played volleyball for four months and they are absolutely exhausted in practice. And they're just not used to sort of working at that sort of pace and intensity. But they're all capable of it, but they're just not used to it. And I think once they get to it, and I think that's where we can... We can spend more time on conditioning through our drills and how we, the pace of things that we run, instead of like in the old days, we would do more conditioning and waste sort of our, our volleyball contact. So I try to keep that pace and intensity going to try to, so we don't have to do some of that fitness type things. It just happens naturally in the pace and, and control of the drills that way. Well, I think you have to judge that as to what levels you're at. I didn't so much at the 13s and 14s, um, but we, in our club we start trying to work some pieces in there. Um, and we have our kids, uh, because at the college we have the Sport Development Center and we have a high performance center there. And so we have our kids work with our Alberta Sport Development Center and we try to get them Sometimes it's a, at the 13s, we'd bring the people in and do some stuff with them maybe once a week. And with the 17s now that I coach, we actually have the girls train outside of the gym doing some strength and conditioning stuff two days a week right now, now that we're into sort of the season. So I think as you progress, you have to start thinking about those types of things. If, and these U17s and U18s, these are, I would say in our community, these are some of the elite players is this is part of the process of trying to prepare them for the next level. So we do some things on, on this outside of practice for sure. There's sometimes I will do some conditioning stuff in practice because we don't get a lot of a chance to really control any of that. I think that cardiovascular stuff is we can do strength stuff, but you know, if they're doing, some of them are doing, I have a couple of girls that are playing basketball and they've, you know, they have no problems with any of those types of things. So I think that's part of it. <coughs> okay, I'm going to, I'll start just talking about this um, um, peaking or playing your best at the right time. I think when you talk about peaking, peaking, tapering, there's a lot of science that goes around it from every sport or activity, whether it's track and field, any types of things. There's a lot of stuff that goes around it. And I think playing the best, uh, your best at the right time is uh, a lot of these things are sort of some of my... Uh, they're my thoughts around sort of taking some of that science and putting it into play as to how I can work it in my club season around the realities of the players that I have, the time commitment that they have, and trying to manage some of that within their lives. Um, I know I could do a whole lot more with some of these kids, but if I do a whole lot more, I think I run the risk of losing some kids, whether it's through burnout or things like that. So. This is, I think, the art to blending some of the science that goes into this. So, but I've always believed that it's not, it's not always the best teams that win. And you'd probably agree with that. It's, a, it's about being able to play your best volleyball 
at the right time. But in saying that, I think as a coach, you have to understand that there's a season of play. And uh, championships aren't won in the first premier tournament. So you have to be willing, I think, to risk losing at times in to work for the big picture. And I've accepted that. And sometimes I think that's hard for us as coaches to take that risk because we're always thinking that winning is really important and maybe even building confidence for the players. When they win, they become <laughs> more confident and that's going to lead to more confidence and so forth. And I, I, I might not disagree with that, but I think I'm willing to, when we go to the first premier or the first tournaments that we have, is to take some risk on losing in certain situations just to try to make to be able to work on things and try different things and so forth. So I think you got to keep that in mind. And so with that, I think when we think about peaking or playing the best at the right time of the season is I think you have to start with, you have to start with a season plan. And this is stuff that's come through the NCCP program where you typically take your season and you look start point, end point, and you divide it into those three phases. And I don't know if this blends <laughs> exactly with the terminologies that are using in today's coaching sessions, but these are probably the same things. It's like the method one, method two, method three, the you know, acquisition, stabilization, integration. But I think of this in the general preparation, specific preparation, and competition preparation side of things. So the general preparation is really <clears throat> that first phase of my season. You know, is the first, if I got a three month season, it's the first month. The specific preparation is my second month and the third month is my competition. Now, don't get confused. That doesn't mean we don't do any competition in the general preparation. But if you go, you go, we're just going to do less competition than we do in the final stage. And so it's simple, but it's, it's about how do I sort of blend these types of things together. And I'll try to show you that so, um, with some kind of complex slides, but I'll, I'll help you get through that stuff. Um, so and my role is to guide them through those different phases and understand the goals of each phase. What, what do we want to accomplish in general? What do we want to accomplish in specific? And what do we in competition? So learning how to manipulate the, the volumes and intensities. And we've seen Keith show you some things about uh, how to manipulate volumes and intensities and Jen we saw some things in her of how you run the drills you can you can manipulate some of those types of things and how they fit into these different phases and then I this last part we'll probably talk a little bit about is about managing your physical and mental fatigue levels so you know I mentioned to you that we do some physical training outside um, and we do that on uh, Thursdays and Sundays so we're gonna practice Thursday before we play in a premier tournament we might not lift our weights on the Thursday just to try to manage some of those physical things, you know? And so if we play in a tournament, you know, on the Saturday, Sunday, we got to practice on Monday, I might actually cancel my practices on Monday, not only because of the physical, but because of the mental co components. And for me, the club season is long and it can be really uh, intense and right now I know I have 17 year old girls that have other interests in life is how do I manage some of those pieces of life in there as well and so I, I, I try to respect that and keep that in mind as I go through my my season that way okay so let's look at general preparation phase uh, of the season so I'll try to I, there's a lot of information on it but I'm just gonna try to break it down a bit so this is when I get to my practice in the first month of the season, so this is where we are right now, I will design my training session. So when the girls come to practice, we will do our warm up and, and ball contacts and stuff. And then I get into the sort of the main part of my practice. And this is where we'll go through this method one, method two, method three, or acquire, stabilize, integrate, okay? so. The acquire part is, is really where we're working on the skills, right? And so we do a lot of volume on the skills. We try to get, we're trying to really get our skills, our foundation in place with our skills. And so if you look down here though, in the start of this month, 
of so it you divide your phase one here into three different sort of weeks maybe say that is I'm gonna at the start of this phase when I come to practice we'll spend about 70 percent of our time sort of in this method one side of things we'll do a lot of sort of ball control skills what do we want to do and then as we progress through this season we'll see 70 percent of part one uh, 20% of where we do sort of this is where we're maybe integrating the skills a little bit more into the phases of the game and then only 10% of the time is we would play you know the, the six on six and stuff we do we might do some modified games might not really true but as I get to the end of this general preparation you can see that we make start to make shifts so I get to 40% I've, I'm decreasing my time on the skills and I'm starting to do more into the phases and I'm starting to get a little bit more time where we get into some of the decision making. And this is, I think, what Jen referred to is we're not ready for that yet. Before we go to the first premier, we need to build a better foundation. And I, I'm a believer in that. We need, to, we need to risk going to the first premier with thinking that we, not that we're not going to try to win, but in the bigger picture, we need to spend this time working on the foundation, not risk it all, spending all of our time on fancy patterns, decision making, stuff that we're not quite ready for even with our skills. So I, I believe in this and try to stay with this kind of model this way. So if that makes sense as you sort of see how we in general preparation it's really about building that foundation that first month or for me it's probably five weeks or so. I think when we think about starting and you know we did our tryouts in December but we don't do much through December. We played a little bit in there. We had a couple of practices. Like I said before, I think it was, it's a little about feeling out. Now I know where we're at. When we start in January, this is where we are. This is our general preparation has really started. And we'll work up to our first premier is spending a lot of time on general preparation. You know, we're at 17 year olds now. So we've, we've done a pretty good, we've got a good foundation in place. So we might be able to vary this 70 it's a guideline right and so I might be able to not it might not be 70 maybe it's 50 for me in this phase depending on where I'm at that way but as we try to add new skills for them that's when we might have to really you know back off and spend a little bit more time so we're trying exploring with like swing blocking I just want to give this a try with these girls and it's it's one of the it's a little bit more complex so we've got to spend a little bit more time at it and this is the this is the phase of the season where we're going to spend that time okay and so when we go into the second phase of the season this one we get into this a little bit more specific this is where we're getting you start to see some of the shifts but you still still see we have a main part of my practice I still have the same components in there the types of drills that fit into those and you see just the percentages really start to change. So 40, 40, 20 in the start of the, se the session or that phase and then 20, 50, 30, we start to change and we just, we're just kind of progressing. So we've now progressed a little bit more into getting a little bit more gameplay, more decision making, all of those types of things as we progress through this second phase. Okay, and so this is like as we get now to maybe our second premier, maybe a little past our second premier, we get a little more information on things we need to change. We see what some of the other things are happening, but we just kind of kind of process this on. You can see some of the things down below that they've they throw in here about technical emphasis, tactical stuff that comes in, physical conditioning, mental stuff. We start to build some of these pieces in a little bit more or a little bit less so we hopefully we're getting a little bit less technical side of things and we start to get more into the tactical side of things as we get into this phase of the season and you know where this is going when we get into the competition phase so this might be our last month of the season is we start to see you know the same information and we just take it and well, all of a sudden we've got less technical so less time spent on sort of the acquisition side of things and we start to progress more into uh, into more into the sort of competition side so in the end of the phase we get to zero percent of where we this is our foundation is in place I'm not going to add anything new 
and I might stop talking about trying to make changes on anybody's thing. We've got what we've got. We're going to just put it into the systems and we're going to run with it and try to, try to keep that going for us. So you see that sort of shift take place in that. And so 70% at the end of that phase is really a lot of game play type things. Now, when we talk about volumes and intensities of this, when we get into this last of the end of this phase, what you should be thinking about is trying to control a, sort of that, the physical side of things as you start, to, your practices generally should become shorter. The intensity goes high, but the volume comes low. So if we were practicing for a two hour session, when we're in this sort of final stage as we're getting ready for provincials, is we're now down to maybe hour, hour 15 practices. We high intensity in game play, game sequence kind of things, and then we back off. We don't practice as long to try to control some of the, the variables of fatigue that way. And that's, I would say, is both physical and mental stuff in there and try to kind of manage that stuff. And I think you have to really, you have to keep an eye on your team, right? Is, uh, and that's, that's the art of it is trying to, how do you pick up sort of the, the mental fatigue or the physical fatigue on your own team? You gotta, that, that takes a bit of work over time is trying to manage that stuff. And you know, the funniest thing that happens for me over the season is my physical and mental fatigue is often not that different from my athletes. You know, when I'm sometimes in that point of where I'm just not sure I really want to go to practice or I don't want to practice, you know what, I have a feeling that for me it's similar with my athletes sometimes at that part of the season. And you got to be really careful with that because if you're not is the last two weeks, three weeks of your season can be completely miserable. You know, you can go to provincial championships and it just collapses and then you've, guess what, you st you've made a commitment to go to nationals and it's in that two weeks of going there is it's miserable again, is it's really hard. It's really hard to repair that and fix that at the end of a season. I know that from experience when I coached in the college year and you, you have to qualify for your nationals. And those, you know, those are, you know, here we get to decide whether we're going to go. But when you have to qualify for nationals is you really need, you need to peak for your provincial championship to get out of your conference. And so you work really hard. And then it's always really hard to keep your team playing at that same level when we would have, go from what would be, 10 days from your provincial championship to when you're starting your national championship. So it's really hard in that, in that sequence. Now for us, is like I know we, with the club is still, we're really trying to peak for provincials because the kids that's, in some cases, that's more important to them than nationals. I, honestly, I think that right now with the girls that I coach is provincials because everybody knows them and they get more recognition for it there. But when we go to Toronto, and you win a national championship, probably the only people that might know that might be back in your home community in a smaller group that way. So there's, there's that feeling to it. So that's trying to manage some of that stuff. So any questions on that general, specific competition? I know that's, that's probably people, it's not nothing new. I might just be adding some pieces, maybe emphasizing some things that you probably know. It's, I think the challenge is how do we how do, we, how do we respect that as we go through the season? How do, we get our, how do we get our egos out of the way sometimes to let us peak for the right competition? You know, like sometimes I think we get too caught up in, uh, you know, winning a premier versus boom. The one I really wanted is at the end there. And so I think that sometimes it's about managing that kind of piece of it. So. Um, this is something I think that I've had to really learn as I, as I, as I taught a motor learning class, I learned a lot about sort of the science of feedback and how that helps learning and motivates players and stuff. So one of the things I've learned to do is to try to fade my feedback. So 
in my general preparation phase is I give a lot of feedback. And <laughs> that's what I saw happening today when Keith was providing a ton of feedback when you were in that drill and you're, you're providing the energy and the intensity to those kids in that drill. This is probably in your general preparation phase with your young kids. And I made a comment this morning about that intensity. I bring the same intensity to my practices that I do to my games. Maybe I bring the same commitment to my practices that I do to my games, but I don't bring that same intensity that he was showing on the floor today with his players when we're in a game. So I, I, maybe I misrepresented that a bit. So when we had a discussion about that, I wanted to say that to you about, but the kids will find that intensity and feedback at the beginning, maybe somewhat uncomfortable, but I can guarantee you that that's not going to stay in every practice as the season progresses. And ultimately, I know my, my job is to really, in the end, is teach them to be independent of me. And so I'm hoping by the end of the season, I don't need to provide that feedback. They've got the understanding that I want them to have. They've figured some things out. They don't need me on their back all the time. They've figured out the intensity that I want, how the, the volume should work in the drill, and how the intensity should feel in the drill. And they can manage that on their own. They've, they've learned that. And then I can fade my stuff. Yep. Yeah, exactly. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, you could see that in the as as we've gone through a practice that's gone through some, you know, method one, method two, method three. I'm hoping that when we're in method three, it's less feedback because you know they've they've got the thing that we were working on early and go. So it it kind of should happen almost naturally that way. Possibly, possibly. I, I think you, that's a big problem is like I've, I've had players that come in and, you know, especially the, we call the goofy foot or wrong footed approach. And we know that it's really a factor in their success in the future, but it's really, really hard for them to change if they've developed a pattern like that. It's really ingrained in them to make that change is, uh, you know, I work hard with them in the first you know, that first percentage of practice will work really hard to try to make those changes. If, it's, if it happens when we get into the phases and the stuff, I might remind them about them. We're trying to change that. I need you to work on that. We get into the competition. If it starts happening there, we might just leave it. And then uh, we readdress it again when we come back to the next day. Or we take them aside and we pull them out if we have the opportunity for that and we can spend more time working on it. But I can guarantee you, you'll drive the kid nuts and uh, you don't want to do that. You want to keep them engaged in the process and keep reminding them and keep working. It won't happen overnight. <laughs> you know, you know it's, it's a long process, especially some of those things like skills like where they've got the wrong footed pattern and it's a timing pattern. It's the same with arm action stuff. You, know, you can't stop them from hitting, but you, it's, it's a long process to change somebody's mechanics of hitting and uh, you've got to do some other things and I think maybe early in the practices you spend more time with them pulling them aside and trying to create things. I know sometimes when I design a practice often it's designed around trying to fix my, one of my weakest links. You know like I'll have it'll be a stronger emphasis on reps for that kid in a situation to create that drill because that drill will likely work not only for him or her but it'll work for everybody else, but I know I'm creating stuff to sort of help him or her change that pattern there. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, a comment to Bob and then Tony step up. I think feedback is important too. It's not always be verbal. Um, on our phones, we have the capability of all having three, mm. excuse me, three apps. So in a, a message three type environment, our feedback can be as simple as setting up the phone, filming the athlete doing this drill that maybe is incorrect. Uh, but not interested. Let them play, let them have that fun, have that freedom. 
Yeah. And then the next day when we go back and see the next one type thing, we have another storm that comes back there that yeah. it's that visual that reinforces um the strategic thing of the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those things are awesome. And you, but I go, you, they take time. And when you're chasing your butt around things, it's hard to get that stuff. But I go, it's awesome stuff. You can use it. <laughs> yeah. He was he was amazing. Yeah, he but again it was a, it was the concept of allowing them to play to figure out a way to get feedback that was not easy. I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, the 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 main point is I, I I think as all coaches, we at some as the season progresses we we need to learn to fade the feedback and take it and take it away. And so I don't know if you're familiar with something called the bandwidth feedback is that there's an, there's an acceptable level of performance that I have. If it goes out of that acceptable level, that's when I'll intervene with feedback. And you change the sort of tightness of that bandwidth that way. But typically, you allow some things to happen in there that you, you might want to say something about, but you're just not going to say it today because it's, it's not totally about that right now. It's about another aspect of the, the practice or the play that way. You know, you need to keep that. So I use, I try to think like that. Okay, it's like, what's my acceptable level and stuff? And some things I just, you know, you might have some things you just say, nope, I got to say it. But I go, there's a lot of times I try to back off on that. Yeah. So I actually stop the play so that I can kind of, okay, this is where you need to be. Now, do you think that's, a, that's, that's something that kids will actually internalize, or do you feel that, that it's better to do that in a block drill or random drill, or like where do you think the feedback should be at? Well, I'm, I'm hoping that the feedback has happened kind of in an early drill when you're you're talking about an attack coverage of how we're going to do this. You've given a lot of feedback how you want it. But I, if you, I would say if you have a teachable moment, is use it. <laughs> but not every moment is a teachable moment. That's, that's where we have to be careful and managing sort of the flow. Otherwise, we could have the flow can just die on something. So, but if I have a teachable moment on something, and maybe it's, a, it's a to, uh, just to reaffirm the positives, like freeze, whoa, this is exactly what I mean, boom try to spend less time on it, but if I have a teachable moment, especially in when I'm thinking in the general prep and specific preps parts of the seasons like that, I'll use those teachable moments in that part of the season for sure. And then I think what will happen is that they'll become different types of teachable moments later on, but they'll probably be a little bit less, especially on the skills and uh, the execution stuff. But I think if you get a teachable moment, I, I would use it. <laughs> yeah, pounce on it, exactly. Um, uh, this one is, I, I just want to say this, like use early competitions as learning situations. So, you know, I know when we get into the competition, we kind of want to let them play. But when we go to the first premier tournament is I give, I still provide a fair bit of feedback in the game situations. It, it's some technical on skill execution. It's a lot more on the systems play because I find that that, 
It's hard to replicate that in practice situations when you have, again, it's maybe a teachable moment that happens in the middle of a premier tournament. I would say I will take advantage of those sort of in those early competition settings. But again, I am really going to fade that by the end of the year. And hopefully I can because we, we figure it out. And one is at the end, they understand why they're doing things. And I think if I can teach them to understand why they're doing some of that things, it will stay with them a lot longer. So I, I spend some time in practice asking questions to them about, do you understand why we're doing that? Tell me why we're doing that. And just trying to make sure that it's, we, we are, otherwise they'll just, I have a lot of yes, yes, heads nodding at times, and I don't think they really are hearing the message, so I will do some of that questioning type stuff because I really want them to understand why. If we can understand why by the end, I think we're, we're getting to the right place, a little bit more of an independent, they understand. And you know, I, th I think over the years I've felt, I've, by doing that, I've created a lot of players that I think have gone on to be really good coaches because they understand why they're doing things and I think they become much better coaches to teach it to other people. Instead of just doing things, they understand sort of why they're doing some of those types of things. So I think feedback is one, you just got to learn how to fade it eventually. Any questions? Well, I got a comment for you. Yep. Uh, you're talking about uh, avoiding mental burnout at the end of the season. Yeah. Well, I, I believe one of the components that will help <coughs> avoid burnout is uh, knowing how much and when to give feedback, especially later in the season. Yeah. If you're still on them all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. I think that's an element. They're already tired physically. The season is dragging on really yeah. long. And you're on them all the time, and it's just like pecking at their brain all the time. It's, uh, it becomes an annoyance. Uh, and sometimes coaches do it from uh, a nervousness or ambition, and uh, they don't mm. realize that it's counterproductive. Yeah. Because they've heard it already, you know, many yeah. times. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of, I think, uh, redundant feedback that happens in coaching. You know, y your players know they missed the serve. <laughs> you don't need to tell them those kinds of things. There's a lot of things that we, we do, and we do that sometimes as parents, you know. And <laughs> those are the types of things I, I think. <coughs> sometimes kids don't see... Feedback as feedback. What do they see it as? Nagging, right? Criticism. And you're going to have players on your team. I have players on my team that um, some, they love feedback. Others, they hate feedback because they see it as a criticism. You're criticizing me and they get really defensive about well, things. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree, but I, I remember times when I took feedback as criticism and I took it personal. And I was, you know, you, you think back to sometimes and I went, geez, that probably wasn't a really strong trait that I had. You get defensive about things, you're feeling like you're, I can't do anything right. Uh, I, I, when I think I've experienced that, I go, I know that I've, I can make certain kids feel that way. Intention zero but that's what happens so I think your point is that you th you think you might be providing them good feedback but if they perceive that as nagging I guarantee you that's going to wear down their mental feel for the season so I think that's a bit of the art science of all of this trying to manage us and being aware of that kind of stuff yeah Stimulating, challenging, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is way off topic, but I kind of wanted to get, because one of the things that we get, at, even at the, at the school level, maybe even more than club, although club is there too, is that we have 12 kids on a team, and our six are classified as a starter rank, right? Whereas those other six don't seem to get a lot of, like, 
playing time sometimes, especially as you get older. Not so much in the younger, but especially as you get older. So what kind of feedback do you give those kids specifically to increase the mental so that they're not, I'm never doing this again. I sat on the bench the whole season. You know, and, and I think that that has to come from the coaches. Yeah. Because, I mean, even these six that are first stringers or whatever you want to call them are looking down on these six that don't ever get to play. And I think that we need to make some, some changes there. I think we need to make some transition. Yeah. And I, I just, I hate that. Yeah. Anyway. It comes up. Keep players involved throughout the season. <laughs> That's perfect. Like I go, you will not peak. I think you, you will not play your best at the end of the season with just six players, six happy players on your team. You, you need to have, I think, 12 engaged players to play your truly best at the end of the season. I, I truly believe that. And I think you have to find ways to manage that throughout your season. And I see that far too often, and that's all I'll say, is sometimes in the first premier, I'm willing to sacrifice to make sure that I get the feel that my team is together as a team as we go through the season. I agree with you, but some teams you have the luxury of having a Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, when you got nine players, it's really easy to keep yeah. players happy. Well, yes and no. Well, what happens if number nine is very challenging? You can find ways to get that player in one or two or <laughs> one time every match, every game, you can probably find a place. And I think coaches need to find a way to be exactly. creative, That's creative to do that. That's that is an art. But you have to be brave enough to, to do it. And understand the fail, failure involved with it and learn from the failure involved with it. And all those kinds of things that go with it. You have to be willing to do that. And some of us aren't. And I see that sometimes and we get lost in, as coaches, it's about winning versus really developing the player that way. And I, you, don't get me wrong, I like to win probably just as much as anybody else. But I, I really try to sort of manage that. And the experience for this comes from being a, I was one of those players in my volleyball career where I was on the bench and I remember those emotions of never getting on the floor and just thinking this is nah, what am I doing here like you, and I know those emotions the thoughts of not being a good teammate because I was felt like I was totally removed so I take that from that experience and I try to find ways to make sure that the players on my bench are getting involved in playing and trying to be part of the team. But I can also say that this sometimes doesn't turn out because you try to play some players, but it's never enough. You, you'll find that it's never enough. They'll still be frustrated with it. But I think all we can do is try to find ways to blend those players in and go. And that, my point on there is that trying to keep them involved is I, I try to find ways to develop roles. I think it's easier as we get to the 17s and 18s, people will, they, they start to figure it out that they're not quite as good as this player and they know that in certain situations they're, they're going to not play and some. But I think you as the coach have to find those situations of when you can get them in to play. You really have to find that. And, and that, that, takes, that takes some risk <laughs> to, to just do it. You might concede the victory to make sure you can get some people in. And you'd be surprised sometimes how it flips around and changes the whole match. And so are the kids told these roles, or is this something that they're going to discuss with coaches? Or are, they, are you communicating this to No, them? I think you need to, uh, especially, uh, you need to communicate this to them. Don't, don't expect them to figure that out, because uh, some will not figure it out. And they'll think that they should be, why am I not starting the whole time? And I think you, sometimes you have to have some of those hard conversations with, with them. I'm finding it really easy with the group I have right now. They know, they can, they can see what's going on and they can kind of see where they fit. They figure out sort of the pecking order of things. Um, but I still think that, you know, my third power hitter is I have to find ways to get her in because she may at one point guess what, she may be my first or second, she may be my second, star, st second power hitter because somebody gets injured. And if I haven't played her all season, 
what, what's going to happen? Am I going to play my best volleyball at the end of the year? Probably not. So I think you got to you got to get them in and give them chances when you and in volleyball it's hard because it, what I've learned over the time is volleyball is such a game of momentum, right? And if it just shifts one notch, it can all of a sudden it can just totally go the opposite direction and you made that one change and then the worst thing is we sub that player back out put somebody else back in and the momentum really probably doesn't change because we've we've totally lost it late in this game so we've created another amplified the anger of a player in that situation so um, I know there's some challenges with that but I I challenge people to sort of find a way to get them in there find the playing time find a way to give them a role let them understand their role and try to build that. And I think that doesn't start by just at the tournaments. It's in practice. You put them in in extra situations to give them extra reps on defense, to give them extra reps on passing, give them extra reps on serving, work on their, if they're not going to be a starter, let's work on that skill of maybe a serving that they can go in and you're comfortable. Maybe it's just to make a serve, you know? And they go in, and they, but they play a role. And if they have a good experience with that, I think we can build on those types of things. But I think that takes a bit of work. I, I hate the idea about our game of the starters, non-starters, veterans, rookies. I just hate those words. I, I try not to use those Wait. words. Yeah, the rookie this. I don't use that. Yeah, it's, sure. it's, I think it's wrong. And I think school, high school volleyball or high school sports in general mm. are horrible. I agree. For this type of, of, yeah. of thing. And I think that they do a disservice yeah. to our team. Yeah. I, I, I would agree. I agree. I saw some of that happen in a school program that I'm somewhat close to. I just think that that's, you, sh you, you, you cannot create sort of a, I would try to minimize the hierarchy of status and such on my teams. Even to the point on my teams is I often try to avoid a captain. You know, like I, I know we not, it's, there's a purpose for it, but, you know, we go to our first tournament and they're asking who's the captain. I said, well, you go. Yeah. You go this yeah. game. You know, we just, I tend to rotate it around because it's, it's, it, it creates a bit of the status type stuff. And I think if we can minimize that and how do we, how do we play our best at the end? Would you say one minute? We're over? Wow, that's gone fast. A couple of key points I'll just throw out. Is like the parts about know your team, I put in there. Know your strengths, weaknesses. Uh, we've heard a couple comments in there about knowing what, choosing your systems and stuff like that. If you want to play the right volleyball for your team, you got to know your strengths, what you can manage and what you can't manage. Like I know we want to try things, but when you're at the end of your season, you want to know what you do well, is what I, I think is trying to know, know what we do well and what we don't do well. Um, know some of the characteristics of your play um, and train those phases, situations in practice. So one of the things, I put this, the setter attack situation. You see the lots of time now where the setter's setting the ball and they're just setting it over. We used to just frown on that as coaches, but how many times the setters are scoring on that stuff now and it's happening all the time. And I go, so that's one thing now. I spend more time creating that phase or situation in my practices to do that. And at our level, it's, it's quite easy because the kids spectate way too much in the backcourt. They're not really paying attention to things until the ball's you know, being attacked to come over. So you have to build that in. I think figure out what are some of the characteristics of your level of play and go on that. Know your opponents. This same stuff, a focus on the process stuff, is really, I, I emphasize this in my other session was, think about how do you want to play, not so much about the outcome. The outcome will often take care of its play, its, it, its result by the way we deal with our process that way. And then I think a peaking at the right time is about finish with the right mindset. I read this from a guy, Dr. Patrick Cohen was, uh, reaching peak performance is not a sometime thing. There is not a peak performance switch you can turn on in competitions. It's a mindset that guides an athlete's choices, decisions, actions every day. So when we're in practice, you know, the intensity, the focus, that kind of stuff is, 
is, you know, it's the practice like you play type stuff, is really emphasizing that stuff. And again, is that it's peak performers, not necessarily the more talented, it's just the ones that are more committed to that every single day. And a lot of athletes can reach their peak performance, you know, in different ways. So I thought that was good, you know, train like you mean it, you're all in every practice. And I know when I see Keith's little bit of intensity, when the two girls that were sitting me beside me when I was watching your session, she was just, that made her nervous. That would just stress me out like that. I said, you know, but you, that's the all in intensity and I know you'll back that off kind of as they go. Yeah, there's a, there's a difference. Yeah, yeah. That, well, totally, that's right. But So in the end, I go, I don't think this is really anything probably earth-shatteringly new, but it's how do you manage that into your season to try to think, and maybe if there's one or two points in there, you kind of go, yeah, that's something I could do. I think that's, that's all I can kind of offer you on that. But I go, it's, it's a challenge to manage that type of stuff, and I think you have to sometimes be disciplined to the process yourself and not get caught up in sort of getting lost in uh, the, the immediate outcome type situations like that. It's a bit of a process that way. And I, you know, sometimes we learn that easily in an in a eight month season because you really know that championships are not won at the first preseason tournament. You've got to figure out how do I manage this all the way through. You know, and you shorten that up into a four-month season. It's the same uh, principles that apply in there. So, thank you. All I got. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Ron. Yep. Um, so we are quick on time here. Uh, Two twenty. We're back down in the gym uh, for serving with Dr. Uh, Lawrence Bula, um, and everyone's all together. So. Right down there. Thank you. Hey, uh, pay attention to this guy. Next guy's uh, intensity and passion when he's.